Lecture 7 of uh, MSc 5223 Additive Manufacturing. We are going to be talking about, um, we talked about some of the um, initial ideas about stereolithography and uh, various material systems and so on. Uh, the current uh, lecture will cover uh, the last part of the stereolithography process and I wanted to introduce you to a technique called design of experiments. Not all of you might know what it is. Uh, I would like to talk about that in general with respect to a particular project that I did um, and then we will continue with the different techniques based on powder bed fusion, which is one of the most important industrially relevant processes that is available in the market today. So, um, we talked about uh, stereolithography and uh, what it does and things like that. And It's basically, I mean, when you are scanning a particular layer or uh, form, you're going to be seeing that the laser will uh, go from point to point depending upon how you have defined it in your CAD model. And this, the one of the uh, companies that makes these machines is 3D systems as we talked about earlier and um, you know in your last homework I wanted you to look at uh, what are the uh, commercially available uh, equipments and what their prices are and so on. So to reiterate this process creates solid parts by selectively solid, solidifying a liquid photopolymer using a UV laser. And they are, you make them for each cross section, each cross sectional layer, and by building them one on top of the other, you build the whole part. And it is pretty similar to what you have in all the other additive manufacturing processes. So this is a typical uh, stereolithography system. This might be like 2007 or 2008. There might be better uh, uh, machines out there and more cheaper machines out there. But this is one of the largest machines that you might be able to find. So this is a uh, industrially, I mean, this is a big machine, but there are cheaper machines and smaller machines available now. So, in this process, uh, what is going to control the properties uh, is your reaction between the laser, between the energy and the UV resin. It controls the final mechanical properties, it controls the cure depth, it controls the critical exposure and peak exposure and so on. So, when you scan a laser beam across a laser surf across a resin surface, uh, it will go inside the resin to a certain depth. That will depend upon many factors, and you have to consider what is the width of that UV beam, as well as the shape of the cured line, which will depend on the resin characteristics, how much energy you are inputting in the laser and your scanning speed. For example, if you scan it at a very fast rate, uh, you're not going to be able to have the laser go in by as much depth. Whereas if you do it at a very slow rate, it's going to be able to go to a much um, larger depth. But that is all going to control what is the speed of manufacturing. So you have two choices. One is you can either make the part 
over many many days or you can make the pot in a very short time. So since this is an industrially relevant process, you do not want to take forever to make a pot. So all these things have to be taken into account. And you can control all that in the, uh, in the software, the machine software, that is the interfacing software between your CAD model and the machine. So the first factor is called irradiance and that is the radiant power of the laser per unit area and it is a volumetric function and it is a, uh, it can be given in a Gaussian uh, laser beam so it's an exponential format and if you look at the nomenclature itself, these are the different nomenclatures. So what are the things that you, you can get? Um, you have to look at the cure depth. You have to look at the depth of penetration. You have to look at how much time uh, you can have the beam get exposed. Uh, what is the critical exposure um, before? I mean, how long do you have to expose the resin to the UV beam before it starts solidifying and what is the maximum exposure of the laser on the resin surface what is the center versus what is the distance over which it will have to be uh, shining so that will control uh, your um, how many times you will have to raster the beam over the entire area so how do you make this part? I don't know if you, if you remember my saying this. What you do is when you have scanned the different layers, on each layer you would first have the laser create the perimeter. It will first put the perimeter, then you have the inside which is empty. So that inside will have to be uh, hatched so the laser beam will hatch at different lines and what happens is that when you hatch that you are probably going to have small gaps at the points where the beam is going to hit the perimeter and return so you may have to go back and raster pattern that again so that you do not have any kind of defects in the part. Otherwise, that is going to affect your mechanical properties. So, if you know your irradiance, you can know what is the cure depth. And Z is obviously the depth and that is typically a function of the resin itself and so you have um, at any given point x any given coordinate x along the scan line it is given by that and so it's a, it's a very complicated shape but all these things are taken into account by the machine and you don't have to, you typically don't have to worry about these things, but these things have already been optimized. And all you have to do is just put all the information in. I mean, what is the, what is the depth and how much it is. So it will automatically uh, take all that into account. Okay, so you can also calculate the exposure based on all this and based on that you can understand what is the interaction between the laser and resin so when it is shining the, the, when the laser is being shown on the resin surface you will have I mean it is going to cure in a parabolic form okay now that parabolic form this is one line and you will have another parabolic line here based on the raster. 
So you are going to have some amount of non-cured areas here. So you are probably going to have some level of porosity and non-bonding and things like that. So but due to this cure, over a period of time, part of this will also cure. And afterwards, there is some resin left behind and you take it and post cure it. And due to the heat, all that remaining material will also get cured. Okay. So this gives you the maximum, so you can control the maximum line width that can be cured. And based on that, you can calculate what is the cure depth. So based on this, this is going to be the cure depth. CD is a cure depth. So there are two important aspects that comes out from this. First is that the line width is proportional to the beam spot size. So if you have a very wide beam spot size, typically that will reduce the cure depth. So if you want a greater cure depth, the line width must increase, all else remaining the same. And this is important when the interfacing software will compensate for all that when it is planning for the process from this. So from that, it can determine how much time it is going to take for making this part. So that will control the cost of your final part because it will control. So for the same part, it will need the same amount of resin, resin. So the cost, the raw material cost of the resin is going to be the same. But what is going to be the difference? The difference is the time to make the part. And the time to make the part is going to be directly proportional to the line width in case in return, it is going to be controlled by the cure depth and in return controlled by the beam width, beam spot size. I hope you are understanding what I'm trying to say here. So again, I mean, there are um, some aspects to a commercial stereolithography machine. So you have what is called the working curve equation. And these have already been, Emacs and EC have already been given in the previous one. So if you want, you should go back and look at it. So you can actually plot the critical, I mean, you can calculate the critical energy required for getting the right kind of cure depth. So if you want to increase the DP and the CD, you can control all that. I'm sorry, I mean, there is a lot of um, uh, writing here, <laughs> which might all sound like mumbo jumbo here, because most of the time we don't even we don't even come across these things. Those things are all controlled by the machine's interfacing software itself. So, but you know that these things have already been taken into account by the machine based on all these parameters. Okay, so uh, you can also calculate the scan velocity but these things are again, they have already been calculated. So what happens is that each machine manufacturer has a method to calculate the maximum scan speed. And what it does is, uh, it essentially tells you how good your part quality is going to be um, controlled by how fast you can make a prototype part. So if you make a part very fast 
you are not going to get a very good surface finish. But if you make it slow, that is going to affect your how much time it is going to take for you, for you to make this part. So there is a balance between the two. So again, these are um, some of the factors that will uh, come into account, come into play when you are looking at the part quality and so on. So I won't go over too much about this. Uh, so essentially, you should know that these things can be controlled. That's all you need to understand. Okay. So, but what you need to understand is that. I mean, we talked about this earlier in the previous lecture that there are the acrylate based resin systems uh, have a much higher shrinkage during the curing reaction than epoxy based resin systems. So that is going to control uh, how much it's going to curl and warp and things like that. But having an epoxy type of resin system will reduce the curling and warpage. But sometimes some of these epoxies can take hours or days to polymerize. So Many times you have to take the part out after fabrication, after, after the part has been built and post cure it in order that the polymerization is completed. So again, um, there are many different factors. So the, the scale, time scales are, I mean, for, for a, for a particular layer, it's called scan time is called TD, uh, and it can vary between 10 to 300 seconds, and these can vary by about uh, depending upon the stereolithography process and the resin systems by about 14 orders of magnitude. So, what are the questions to be answered when you may want to make the part? Are there software strategies that you can adopt to avoid the curling and distortion during and after the build process? How much unreacted resin is going to be held inside the part? And how much of the distortion is a function of the unreacted resin content? And you may want to take a look at uh, some papers to discuss that. Okay, so I mean, this is not a homework uh, problem, but I want you to maybe you should take a look at uh, some of some papers to do that. Okay, um, I want to bring some ideas about term paper. So our homework assignments are going to be approximately 40% and term paper is going to be 50%. And I, I originally thought, you know, we would have classroom participation and contribution on discussion groups up to 10%, but I'm not really sure that is going to be the case. So what I might end up doing is the homework assignments are going to be 50% and the term paper is going to be 50%. And what am, I going to, what am I expecting from your term paper? So I would like you to think about a term paper. Uh, I don't know if any of you have started thinking about it. You have approximately three more weeks to go. So please start doing that. Otherwise, the time is just going to uh, go away like that. I want you to take this and write a technical paper on any material or additive manufacturing technique and it should be formatted to a technical paper standard and no grammatical errors, no obvious glitches, no cut and paste from a technical paper 
and when you are writing it from other papers, please paraphrase your ideas rather than copy that verbatim, okay? Because when you look at the papers, I can easily see whether or not you have copied it or you have paraphrased it verbatim. I mean paraphrased it rather than verbatim copied. So your paper should have an introduction, materials and methods, results and discussion, um, and what I would also like you to add is um, some of the things that you are doing. I want you to describe what are some of the challenges currently. And if you had the opportunity, what would you do to overcome those challenges? And please also remember that a technical paper is written in third person and you can use many, many different uh, sources. One of the most important uh, sources is Rapid Prototyping Journal or Journal of Rapid Prototyping. There are many, many different uh, journals. Um, there could be others also. And uh, you can also use SciFinder and uh, um, yes, Science Direct is okay, but Science Direct is so old time. Okay, so please use some new sources of information. Okay, I'm going to stop here for this paper, I mean for this part of the lecture and I will continue afterwards.